This is going to be a demonstration of the interior of the ventricles. I'm holding the heart in my left hand. So this is the sternocostal surface of the heart, which is formed mostly by the right ventricle. And this is the diaphragmatic surface of the heart, or the inferior surface of the heart, which is formed by the left ventricle. So we have made an incision along the inferior border of the heart, which also is formed mostly by the right ventricle. And then we have continued the incision on the left margin of the heart, which is formed by the left ventricle. And then we have made an incision on the anterior surface or the sternocostal surface of the heart. And now I'm going to reflect this to show the interior of the right ventricle. So this is the interior of the right ventricle. We notice these ridged muscular part. These muscles, ridge muscles, are referred to as the trabeculae carnea. And if you trace them up, we find that this, where my finger has gone in, this is the outflow of the pulmonary trunk. This is referred to as the infundibulum or the conus arteriosus. In the region of the outflow, we notice that the muscular portion disappears and it becomes smooth. Because wherever there is inflow or outflow of blood, that portion will be smooth to prevent turbulence. And the junction between the trabeculae carnea and the smooth portion is marked by a circular ridge. And that is known as the supraventricular crest. The next thing you notice are the leaflets of the tricuspid valve and the chordae tendinae and the papillary muscles. Because it's the right side, there are three leaflets, three papillary muscles and three sets of chordae tendinae. Chordae tendinae are the ones which connect the leaflets to the papillary muscles. So this is the anterior leaflet, which I have lifted up. The anterior set of chordae tendinae attaching to the anterior papillary muscle. The one behind this, this is the posterior valvular leaflet, posterior papillary muscles and the posterior chordae tendinae. And this is the interventricular septum. Chordae tendinae, which are attached to the interventricular septum, the papillary muscles, they refer to the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve. So therefore, the tricuspid valve has got anterior, posterior, and septal. The next thing I would like to draw your attention to is this muscular band extending from the interventricular septum to the base of the anterior papillary muscle. This is referred to as a septomarginal trabecular, or the moderator band. This helps to regulate the conduction fibers of the right bundle through the moderator band to the base of the anterior papillary muscle and coordinate the contraction of the anterior papillary muscle on the right side. The function of the papillary muscle is when the ventricle is contracting, the papillary muscles also contract and therefore they prevent prolapse of the leaflet of the valve into the atrium. So these are the structures we notice on the right ventricle. I would like you to notice the thickness of the musculature of the walls of the right ventricle. Now let me mention a quick word about the pulmonary outflow itself. We see that the pulmonary outflow in this cadaver is already open. These are the semilunar valves. The semilunar valves are called semilunar because they are half moon shaped. The free margin of the semilunar valves are referred to as the lunule and the central portion is slightly thick and that is referred to as the nodule. The nodules ensure a watertight closure. These valves, they are referred to as the cusps. At the place where the cusps are attached to the walls, just above that there is a small dilatation. These are referred to as the sinuses. So therefore, there are three pulmonary sinuses. There is one anterior sinus, one right sinus, and one left sinus. So this is the pulmonary outflow. Now I'm going to turn the heart a little bit to show you the interior of the left ventricle. And as I've told you, we have already made the incision and I'm reflecting the walls to show the interior of the left ventricle. Straight away, we notice that the wall of the left ventricle is much thicker than the wall of the right ventricle. This is the wall of the right ventricle and this is the wall of the left ventricle. The left ventricle wall is three times as thick as the right ventricular wall. Again, we can see the muscular portion inside, which is known as the trabeculae carnea. The next thing I would like to draw your attention to are the cusps of the mitral valve. We can see only two cusps and I'm going to put my finger inside the left atrium and we can see it is coming to the left ventricle. So therefore, this is the anterior cusp, this is the posterior cusp and we can see that they are attached to the anterior papillary muscle by means of the chordae tendinae and we can see this is the posterior papillary muscles and these are the chordae tendinae. Again, we can see the smooth outflow portion. This is the outflow portion and again, I'm going to put my finger in and we can see it is coming into the aorta. That is referred to as the aortic vestibule which flows into the aortic orifice. 
demarcation between the trabeculae cardiae and the smooth outflow portion this is called the supraventricular crest now let me mention a few points about the semilunar valves of the aortic outflow or the aortic vestibule the basic characteristics are the same we can see the semilunar valves these are the cusps of the valves they are attached to the walls of the aorta and just above their attachment there is a small dilatation which is referred to as the aortic sinuses the free margins of the valves are referred to as lunule and the central portion is referred to as the nodule in this particular cadaver the aortic valve is already closed but we can separate them these dilatations in the case of aorta here we have two anterior one posterior so this is the right anterior this is the left anterior aortic sinus in the right anterior aortic sinus we have this opening where my probe has gone in and that is known as the right coronary ostium and we can see that the probe has come into the right coronary artery similarly in the left aortic sinus there is another ostium that, which opens into the left coronary artery so this is the left coronary ostium the posterior aortic sinus is referred to as the non coronary sinus because no coronary artery arises from that now i am going to show you an important hemodynamic feature i have put one finger inside the left atrium and my finger has come into the left ventricle and i would like you to notice the direction of my index finger i am going to put my next finger inside the outflow and i am going to bring it out through the aorta we notice that the inflow to the ventricle is vertically inside and the outflow is vertically outside so therefore the blood flows vertically into the left ventricle and flows vertically out so as it flows out it makes a 180 degrees bend now let's come to the right side again i'm going to put my finger in the atrium and i'm going to bring it into the right ventricle and i'm going to put my other finger in the outflow of the right ventricle so we can see that my two fingers are making a 90 degrees angle so the inflow into the right ventricle from the atrium is in this axis it is horizontal and the outflow from the right ventricle is vertical so therefore the blood makes a 90 degrees bend in the right ventricle to flow out of the pulmonary trunk the next thing i would like to draw your attention to is my right index finger is on the left ventricle it's in the interventricular septum the muscular part and my left index finger is in the right ventricle again in the muscular part of the interventricular septum so therefore my two fingers are on the interventricular septum this can be a site of ventricular septal defect usually a small ventricular septal defect in the muscular part closes by itself so therefore it does not require any intervention however there is a portion of the interventricular septum which is not visible here and that is known as the membranous part of the interventricular septum and there can be a defect and that is known as a ventricular septal defect which is by far the most common congenital cardiac defect and if such a defect is present then it requires surgical closure there are many congenital anomalies pertaining to the heart but these are just a few of them which we wanted to mention thank you very much for watching dr sanjay sanyal signing out david is the camera person if you have any questions or comments please put them in the comment section below have a nice day